Hi folks, in this video we're going to discuss the rule arrow intro. You've already learned how to do arrow elim, which is just modus ponens. That's how we reason from an arrow claim or a biconditional. Arrow intro is a more complicated rule, and it's a bit like the reductio rule or proof by cases rule because it requires a subproof. It's the analog to conditional proof. What we do if you want to prove something of the structure P arrow Q, what you do is you have to temporarily assume the antecedent. Because remember, we're not trying to prove that Q follows outright from our premises. We're just trying to prove that if P is also true, then Q has to follow. So it's like getting an extra assumption. It's like getting an extra premise, but it's just a temporary assumption. And if we can show in a subproof that you can get from P to Q, so the antecedent starts the subproof and the consequent ends the subproof, then you write P arrow Q down here, jumping out of that subproof line onto the main scope line. Now, by conditional intro, this should be no surprise, works the exact same way. You just have to go in both directions. So you first have to go from left to right and then go from right to left. Notice this, you do not first have to introduce the P arrow Q part and the Q arrow P part. You don't literally make two conditionals. You know, remember, logical systems are just things that we make up. They're, they're models that we make. They're theories. And so we could have created a system where you first have to prove P arrow Q, you also prove Q arrow P, and then you say those two things in order to justify this. That would be just another logical system. But that is not the way this system works. You go straight from these subproofs directly to our biconditional. So we're going to do something a little more efficient. All right. Let me also say... Whenever you have an arrow conclusion, this is always the best way to approach our proof. So thinking strategically about looking at main connectives, anytime I see an arrow conclusion, I'm happy because it tells me exactly what kind of structure to pursue. It doesn't matter, for example, if P and Q are complex. Like, let's say I'm trying to prove this, this logical truth that's a sort of a De Morgan law. Uh, notice this. My, com my, consequent, my antecedent here is this complex sentence. My consequent is this complex sentence. So if I want to prove this arrow, I put the antecedent up here and I reproduce it exactly, and I put the consequent down here. Now, you might be wondering, why did I keep these parentheses and why did I drop these? Because remember, you always drop outermost parentheses, but there are no outermost parentheses here. The negation is wide scope, so you can't just drop those parentheses. But notice here, these outermost parentheses are inessential, and it would be totally redundant to have them on here. Um, and so that's why they got dropped, but the ones in my antecedent did not. Okay, let's see if you're following all, all this along. Let's uh, do some practice. Pause your videos and see if you can complete this proof on a piece of paper. Don't worry if you've done this proof before. You need to practice this over and over again. Activate your minds, and then you're going to know the material really well. Okay, that was your chance to pause your videos. Uh, so what I see is a arrow premises and arrow conclusion. And I know people are naturally tempted to start trying to use these premises, but that is not what you should do. Instead, I look at my conclusion. My arrow conclusion tells me what to do. I assume P first. And remember, it's not because I just wanted P up here. Maybe this, maybe line two would have been line one, and you might have thought to assume Q, but that would have done you no good. It's the fact that this P is in the antecedent of this is what tells me to assume P, not because P is in the antecedent of my premise. Uh, and what I know is if I can assume P and get to R, then I'm going to be in good shape. So what do I do next? Well, now that I've got P and I have P or Q, I can just do arrow E them or modus ponens on one and three. And now I've got Q and Q arrow R. So of course I can just get R from arrow E them on those. So it's just a couple arrow E them proofs and that sets me up to this line. What's my final justification? Well, you just cite arrow intro and you cite the subproof that you started with. And I put the informal proof up here just so you see that there's such a close analog between how an informal proof of this would look and a formal proof. Okay, let's, let's practice something a little bit more interesting. Here's a new one. So pause your videos and see if you can figure this out. What we're doing here is we're proving uh, one direction of the contrapositive equivalence. Okay, that's your last chance to pause your videos. Uh, what do I do first? Notice, see, again, we have P or Q as a premise, but we don't start by assuming P. This really should convince you that what we're doing is we're looking at the antecedent of our conclusion. I assume not Q because of this thing. I don't assume P because of this thing. So once I assume not Q and I'm trying to get to not P, now you've got to reassess. Uh, this is a literal. This is a literal. And this, I can't make progress yet. You might think, okay, now I've got to assume P. And 
you're sort of right. Yes, we do have to assume P. But again, it's not because pre P is the antecedent of my arrow. That's coincidental. The reason is because I'm stuck and I need to do a reductio and not P is my conclusion down here. So I'm actually assuming P on line three. Again, not because it's in this thing, which is what I would love to have so I can do arrow elim. It's because it's the opposite of this and I'm doing a reductio. You see, if you assumed P originally just by looking at this, you might have no idea how to get out of that subproof. But if I'm looking at this and I see that I'm doing a reductio, I know exactly how to get out of this subproof. Okay, now once you get P, of course, once you've earned the right to P because you found it the correct way, now you need to just realize that you can do modus ponens on lines one and three. And then of course, two and four give me my contradiction. So there's the rest of the justifications, just filling in the details that we already knew were coming. Okay, let's do one more. We haven't done a biconditional yet, so let's do a biconditional intro. Of course, this is this is both this is sort of going in both directions of the contrapositive equivalence. So this should be familiar from the proof that we just did before. Here's a good check. If you didn't get that proof originally, then you really need to pause your videos now and make sure you can do this in both directions. If you cannot do that without pausing your videos, then you have not been paying attention enough and reviewing the problems enough. And this is really absolutely essential bedrock knowledge that you should be able to prove this thing with a piece of paper with absolutely no notes uh, right off the top of your heads. Okay, that was your last chance to pause the videos. Notice we have no premises. I'm not even uh, assigning a number to this because we don't need any premises. This is a tautology. So what I first do, is I'm gonna go left to right. That means I need to assume the P arrow Q and my goal of that subproof is not Q arrow, not P. Notice this keeps going because this is actually only half the proof. My main scope line goes all the way off the page. My, my line seven subproof, however, ends. That stops there because biconditional intro requires two subproofs. And this is the left to right direction. And notice what I did. All I did was reproduce the proof I gave you before of the contrapositive. And then we need to go in the other direction. So that's assuming not Q arrow, not P. And what I need to get to is P arrow Q. And we do that on line 14. How, of course, do I get to P arrow Q? Remember, I assume the antecedent, which in this case is P. So line nine, I assume P on line nine because I'm looking at my goal is line 14. And I assume on line 10, I assume not Q, not because I want it on for, to do arrow elim on line eight, but because I'm doing a reductio of 13. Because I know once I see on line 14, I need P arrow Q, then I assume P and I try to get to Q. I sort of pencil this in. And that tells me to do a reductio and not Q. And the reason the reductio works, of course, is because this thing is a tautology. So I can do arrow elim with lines eight and 10. Okay, thanks.